Keegan Longira, adventurer, motivational speaker, world changer. You're about to join Keegan on his incredible cycling expedition from Cairo to Cape Town. Relive with him every moment, encounter and emotion of this amazing journey. This series is available in both audio and video. So Keegan, we all want to hear about this epic adventure you went on from Cairo to Cape Town on a second-hand bicycle. But let's, let's go back a little bit two days before the trip, the 30th of December 2014. It's almost the end of the year, almost New Year's. What was happening? What were you thinking? There were so many things going on in my mind. Obviously, the first being packing the bicycle, getting it ready, making sure my flights and everything's in order, making sure my passport and, you know, my visas are ready, and then taking off. But, I mean, it was just like a final goodbye. I was trying to meet with all the people that I hadn't got a, got a chance to, you know, get in to see before I left. So it was almost like these final goodbyes with different people and sharing different special moments, you know. For example... With Brent, I remember him inviting me to go play golf and I'd invited a couple of my sponsors and everybody had bailed out and it was just me and Brent and we got to the golf course and there was just this weird vibe in the air, you know, sort of like he doesn't know if he's going to see me again, I don't know if I'm going to see him again and uh, I remember playing golf the first nine holes, we stopped at the halfway, at the halfway house at Bunkenfeld on this beautiful golf course and he asked me, so are you ready? I just looked at him and I was like, Brent, I have no idea what I'm doing. I didn't have oh. enough money in the bank account. The flights were booked. Everything was in order. And here I was going and I was underprepared. I remember him asking me, are you ready? Like, have you cycled enough? And I was like, I don't know. I've never done this before. So I think there was just this whole vibe of not knowing what to expect. And that round of golf was... And we're getting to the end after 18 holes and sitting down again for, for lunch. And, you know, he was just like, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. I have no doubt that it's going to work out. And you must just not worry about anything. Go and live it day by day. And I held on to that the first couple of days. Just day by day, hour by hour, step by step. Just get through what you're going through now. Oh, but I was really scared. But tell me... Uh I mean, in those de days leading up, uh, tell me about your family. Uh, I mean, w were they also asking you these kind of questions? Were they were they supportive? Did they think you were crazy? <laughs> yeah. I mean. Sure. I, I, I know they, I don't think they thought I was crazy. They knew I was crazy. I'd done a bicycle trip from Woodbank to Cape Town. It's like 2,000 Ks maximum. And here I was attempting to do an epic adventure, like something that I, I mean, if I think five years back, I would have never even have thought about doing it. You know, and here I was, and I was going to, I was about to do it. And I think there was this, this feeling of, are you really going to go right up until the point where I left? You know, my mom was asking me, okay, well, are you really doing this? And Paige would sort of talk about things that were going to happen in the year and asking me, are you, are you sure you're going on this trip? And I think when they saw all the, all the flight tickets and everything stamped and me packing my bike box, then they realized this is happening. This is real. And I mean, my dad was avoiding me quite a bit. I remember him being, you know, very off with me. My mom was emotional. When we used to have a coffee in the morning, she would be crying, you know, like not, not openly, but, you know, she had tears in her eyes. And, you yeah, know, my sisters were very supportive, very, um, I think they just had so much, all the love that they, I mean, sometimes we don't show people the love that they deserve. And I think that at that point, they were showing me all of their love, you know, from both sides. It was just two sisters really just doing everything they could to help me, taking the pressure off. They must have helped. Yeah, a lot. I mean, my, my younger sister, Michaela, is, I mean, she's 16 now. And my older sister, she's, she's two years older than me. So it was like I was in the sandwich of sister love almost <laughs> now. <laughs> And I mean, they were, they weren't asking me tough questions like, what are you going to do? Where are you going to sleep? Do you have enough money? What if you get killed? They weren't asking me things like that. They were just asking me like, what can we do for you now? Do you want a coffee? 
you know, do you want to go to the mall? Do you want to watch a movie? That sort of thing. And that was cool. Took my mind off things a bit. But I'm sure those those questions were going through a couple of people's heads, right? Oh, no, for sure. I mean... Like the what ifs. Yeah. No, I've, I've heard it all. I remember we were at a... We were camping that December with Paige's family and Paige has got a... Her aunt and uncle were there and her mom and dad were there and the kids were all there and everybody... It was just this great holiday until we got to speaking about Cairo to Cape Town. Her aunt was like, you're not coming back. Openly, she was like, this is the end of you. You know what I mean? Sure. We're never going to see you again. Have you seen the stuff that's happening in Sudan? Have you seen the stuff that's happening in northern Kenya? Buses getting blown up, uh, you know, Christians being killed all over... Do you know that you're not coming back? It wasn't. I wasn't even given an option. Sure. And for me, like, I just wanted to turn around and say, have you been there? Because so often we've got this idea of a place and we haven't even been there. You know, we'll just listen, like, or watch the news or get this vague idea. And then we speak like we know it 100%. So I couldn't answer the questions. I was like, I don't know. What if I die? You know, I'm, I'm trying not to think about that. But what can you do? Sure. What can you do if you're in that situation where somewhere along the line, from Cairo to Cape Town, I didn't know the road, I didn't know what it was going to look like, I didn't know the people, I didn't know the towns. If I was confronted with something that was going to cost me my life, that was it. There was literally nothing I could do. I could fight as much as I could, but that wow. was it. Okay, so Keegan, so we still, we're still on the 30th of December, um, two days before your trip. Take me through some of the goodbyes that you had to do that day. Uh, who did you have to say goodbye to on that day specifically? I think the, the biggest goodbye for me was, you know, driving out of the, the golf course and Brent was, was there and his whole family rocked up in the van and uh, his wife was there. Um, Brent's brother was there with his wife and all their kids, so you know, three kids, one of which was Rowan, and Rowan's a, a three-year-old, Brent's son. And, I mean, this guy's blessed my life so much. Um, you know, and he's, he, our kids are just so amazing. They just, they ask these tough questions, eh? You know, like, why, why are you going? And he just puts you on the spot, like, I don't know, why am I going? You know, and for me, Rowan was, you know, giving me a hug and saying goodbye, not really understanding that... Um, you know, I'm going to be gone for a very long time. So it was almost like, okay, cheers, see you later. And I, and, but I knew that I wasn't going to see him for a while. And I think Rowan, for me, uh, like when he was around me, I was always like his friend, brother, dad sort of guy, you know, like played with him a lot. And to, to say goodbye to him, I remember when, we, when Brent and I did a bicycle trip from Woodbank to Belito, Rowan uh, collected these rocks for me. So he gave me this rock, and I've had it in my bicycle bag, my pannier bag, ever since he gave it to me. And that was like his present to me. He went wandering around at Belito and, and got me a rock. And I had that rock in my bag, packed, ready to go. And he didn't know how much that meant to me, you know, to have that, that hope of a, of a child loving you, you know, despite what you're doing. I mean, you're cycling across a continent... He doesn't care. He just wants to see you again. You know, for me, that was that was quite special. To say goodbye to him was tough. And, yeah, you know, just their family. They'd given me so much love and support for such a long time. You know, and it was it was difficult. Yeah, you know, I think those are the, the toughest goodbyes. Mm. Wow. So they were, I mean, just in, the, in this anticipation, in the days leading up, there were so many emotions. I mean, that, that's a battle on its own before you've even started the battle on the bicycle. Yeah. So, okay, so so take us into that that evening. I mean, where did you stay the, the night before you were going to leave for your trip? Where did you stay? And then what what happened the next day, you know, your last day in South Africa? I mean. Hmm. Remember, I, I stayed at Paige's house and, uh, you know, I was, I was tired. Emotionally, I was drained. Physically, I was drained, and I remember going to bed, and when I woke up, I walked into her room and opened the door, and she was lying there, you know, like in the in the middle of the bed, blankets up to her chin, and just so peaceful. You know, her, I remember her face, and just like, 
and I'm like waking her up, you know. And I was like, when am I gonna wake up again? You wow. know, and for me, like, yes, that was hectic because she had done so much for me before, you know, and I knew that she was gonna be going through a lot on the trip. You know, for two months she would be alone and it would be a test of her faith and her character and her everything sure. to see me go. So, I mean, I knew that the goodbye was coming, but I wanted to delay it. I didn't want to do it, you know what I mean? So for me, that whole day was like a goodbye. You know, seeing her wake up, seeing her like lying next to me, I was just like, oh. at, at times I thought, yes, you're an idiot. You really, this is crazy. You might never come back. Um, sure. Uh, and I mean, for you and for her, um, take us through the fear of the unknown. I mean, just like you don't really know what you're getting into. You know, I mean, uh, explain that fear and, and, and what helped you get through that fear or what helped you cope with it? I think the fear was just pure not knowing what to expect. You know, I read stories on Cairo and for me, the first step was Cairo, Egypt. And it's like, when I arrive there, what's going to happen? Do I get on a taxi? Do I, who do I see there? How am I going to recognize the guy? Where's my booking? How am I going to get through the traffic? What am I going to do the next day? Where am I going to get my food from? And all of these things were small in comparison to the trip. But it was massive for me right there because that was the next challenge I was facing. And the way I got through that fear, I think, is reading a lot of blogs. I'd read tons and tons of blogs of different perspectives from from males from females from uh, from everyone you know every walk of life from christians to muslims to i try to get like a, a general idea of the facts of a place and not to read blogs that were too like had a lot of opinion in them so i think for me that that gave me a peace you know i was like this is the way it is don't question it so if the blog says Cairo is nice, go there and just believe that it's nice. Because you can create a situation in your head where you, you know, you've like freeze from panic. You told me, you told me about a song, a particular song in general, um, that day that you listened to that helped you with, with that fear of the unknown. Yeah, that was a uh, hill song, just oceans. And some of the words in that song were just like, you know, especially the I remember the words where feet may fail. You know, and and for me that was like, like I can fail, but I know that there's a purpose in this. There's a purpose on cycling across the continents. I mean, I didn't have the most money. I had a really beaten up bicycle, um, and my wheels may fail. <laughs> You know, instead of feet may fail, my wheels could have failed and I could have. And that, that faith is just, just holding on to the hope that you will get through it. And that's all I had. I just had hope. So that song was, I mean, I, I think I cried every single time I listened to that song. From when I left the airport to getting to Egypt to the first couple of days. Every single time I heard that intro music to that song, it's like God was saying to me, what if this happens? What if you're in a storm? But I'm going to be there. And that was special. Sure. So you had that, you had that assurance. Yeah. Through your faith. Mm. Okay, so, all right. Then off to the airport. Was, was that what you did next? Yeah. Uh, I mean, okay, take yeah. us through that. Well, we first had to make a quick stop at Eastgate um, to buy a journal to write all my blog entries in because Guinness World Record requires you to keep a detailed blog of every single day. Distance, average kilometers, how you felt, where you started, where you stopped, all these things, you know. So I was off to Eastgate, got the book, back into the car, rushing off to the airport. Everybody else was there already because we went in two separate cars. There was just too many people. Um, and then I remember um, OG. OG is one of my best friends. Well, he is my best friend and he's from... He, he lives in Pretoria now, and we've been best friends since grade one. And wow. I remember him coming there with um, his brother and Toby. Now, Toby was also, all of us were at hostel together. And they got to the airport, and they we all had, like, this awesome breakfast at uh, one of the, the restaurants there. 
But again, there was this, like, everybody wanted a piece of you, you know? It was like, everybody wants to say what they need to say to you before you go because they know it might be, you know, too late after that. So the, I was getting phone calls the whole time. I remember while we were at the breakfast there, Hein, a, a guy from Stellenbosch, he runs the um, sports rugby academy and, you know, he does, like, Christian sports ministry down in the Cape. And he phoned me. And he just prayed for me over the phone. And Hein is this, oh, he's like a monster of a man, tall, big shoulders. And he was just so confident. And he, I remember his voice being loud and speaking slowly over the phone into my ear. And we, I think we were, I think we were both crying. You know, I had tears in my eyes. And he has this guy who's mentored me and played a massive role in my trip across Africa, massive. And he, he, he was even, you know, I could hear in his voice. A bit worried, you know, what What are you going to do? How am I going to be able to get hold of you? Where are you going to get your SIM card from? Where's, you know, so even he was asking questions I didn't know the answer to. But when he prayed for me again, just getting this peace about it, like this is your mission. You you were you were born for this. Let's go, you know. And then uh, holding the sign up of all the sponsors and that in the airport, this massive sign was, was embarrassing for Paige, I think. But I mean, it was so, I was so proud. I was like, these guys are getting me through what I'm going to go through. And yeah, we held that sign up, wrapped it up, walked to the terminals and the, and the gates were there. I had to pay like a extra, extra money for, um, the, the, one of my bags was too heavy. You can imagine. I mean, it's a bicycle and everything you're going to need for who knows how long, six months, two months. So I paid that and then I remember coming out and everybody was standing in a circle and the vibe had really changed. But it, but at this stage, who's everybody? I mean, I mean who, who, is, yeah. who is with you now at the airport? So my mom was there, my dad was there, my two sisters were there, Paige was with me, um, OG was there, Ura was there, and Toby was there. So they had formed this little semicircle and they probably discussed who's saying goodbye, when, and things like that. And I remember walking through that gate and the vibe had really, really changed. I mean, they were looking at me, OG wasn't smiling and OG always smiles. And I remember just greeting each one of them and them all whispering something in my ear that meant so much to me. You know, from like, from OG to, to my mom whispering, just come home, you know, and that like put so much pressure on you, like. I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what I'm walking into, but my mom needs me home. And I remember hugging Paige and giving her a kiss and hugging her, and she was the last person I said goodbye to. And I hugged her and I kissed her and I whispered in her ear before she could whisper in mine, I just said, keep praying. And I didn't mean keep praying for me, I meant just keep praying for you because you're going to have a tough time. Mm. You are going to have a tough time now. You know, and I walked away and I said in the back of my mind, you're not looking back because I promise you, if I looked back, I was going back. I wasn't going to get on that plane. And I, I knew they, I knew they were looking at me and I, so I could feel their eyes on me. And here I am walking through the terminals. Yeah, I remember just putting my phone off and saying to myself, okay, keep your phone off for an hour so you can't get all the messages that they're going to be sending you. Like, because it was going to make me emotional. So I put my phone off to just to make sure I got on that plane. And at that time, Brent was messaging me as well, just wishing me the best. And, and his wife was messaging me. And I'm sitting in that terminal looking at all these, you know, different types of people getting on a plane for various reasons. And I was just humbled, you know, everybody had a mission. Everybody was getting on an airplane to go do their mission. And this was mine. And it's as simple as that. I was getting on a plane going across to the other side of the world, and I was on a mission. What was that mission, Keegan? I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm sure you must have actually been questioning that, and, mm. and your family and friends must have actually been wondering, what, what, what was your mission? Why did you do this? The first time I looked at the Guinness World Record, uh, I did a quick calculation, divided, the day, divided by the distance by the days of the previous record holder, and, and try to figure out if I could do it. And the, honestly, the first time I looked at the number, I was like, no ways, not across Africa for that amount of time. You're not gonna, it's, 
impossible. But when I said I wanted to cycle from Cairo to Cape Town, the doubt and the negative feedback that I got back from people was like unbelievable. So then I added in that whole Guinness World Record attempt to sort of say to people, listen, I'm getting across Africa by faith from Cairo to Cape Town. I'm going to make it. I'm going to live. I'm going to survive. And by aiming at that point, you know, the Guinness World Record, Africa is a given. So you're going to get across Africa. Just how quickly are you going to get across it? So I think by saying I, I want to break a Guinness World Record was a personal thing for me to make sure that I did come back almost. And But my mission was to, yeah, to cycle across Africa as quickly as I could and get home. Just yeah. for the fun of it? No, well, to prove a point, to inspire, I mean, yeah. why? You know, charity has always been, you know, really, really big for me. In my, in my heart, um, I saw David Greer do a talk, and he's the guy who ran the Great Wall of China. And I remember listening to him talk, and after the talk, he, he started to show these pictures of kids with cleft lips and pellets. And I don't know who was crying more in the audience, David Greer or, or the whole audience, but I mean, everyone was moved. And, and I thought to myself, you know, you, you love sports, you've got a talent, and you need to, you need to do something. You know, so it was almost like I felt in that moment that I needed to do something, I needed to do my bit to raise money for these kids. And that's when I decided, I walked up to David Greer. Now, David Greer is a celebrity. I mean, he's on TV, magazines, written books, The Real Meal Revolution. He's written that book with Tim Noakes. And I told him, David, I'm going to cycle from Cairo to Cape Town, and I'm going to raise money for these kids. And yeah, I remember what he said to me. He's like, there's a lot of people that have said this to me, a lot of people. What makes you different? In that moment... I realized that there is a massive difference between saying you're going to do something and actually following through and doing it. And, you know, then I, then I, I raised money for Operation Smile for two years, went on this mission with them and thought I knew everything about Operation Smile and charity until I watched a kid get in surgery, standing in that room with some of the best plastic surgeons in the world, the best nurses in a terrible operating room I mean the equipment was run down the roof was falling and there was this kid in Malawi getting his life changed and we were treating it like a job you know we were like this kid's off the table next kid comes in and not to say that that's how they treated him they had a mission to do as many surgeries as they could but I mean I think I had an appointment there with that kid and I watched his lip go from split open to completely fixed and I followed him through the surgery process and sat with him in the recovery room. And as he was waking up, the nurse gave him a mirror. And she, she, you know, put the mirror in his hand and he started to pull the mirror closer and closer and closer to his face. And he just couldn't believe it. He was, I mean, they were trying to hold his hand behind his back so he didn't touch his, his lip, you know, for infections and things like that. But I mean, this kid was amazed. His life had literally been changed in 45 minutes. And once I realized that 5,500 Rand could do that for one child, that I wanted to make a massive difference, that I wanted to raise as much money as I could. And what better way to challenge yourself physically, to do something that people say you can't do. I mean, across Africa is probably one of the toughest cycling, cycling routes. And yeah, I think to break a Guinness World Record just brings that, that element of... Uh, you know, people following it more. And by people following it more, you can raise more money for charity. So the more people know about it, the more money you can raise, the more lives are changed. And that's the mission. Wow. Mm. That's, that's inspiring. I mean, most, most people won't even, won't even reach out to somebody just across their, their own city, you know, and, and help, help, uh, help people uh, or just give money to, a car guard or to a beggar that's outside your window, but you were prepared to go across the entire length of, of Africa uh, to help these kids. That's what a sacrifice. Yeah, I think 
where there's a need and we are able to meet it, we've got to do something. Because if we sit back and wait for somebody else to do it, it's never going to get done. And I think a lot of problems in the world are caused by people not meeting a need where they can. So I think it's as simple as that. It wasn't a massive sacrifice. It was just me doing what I could in a small way. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to the airport <laughs> and, and the airplane. So you're in there. Okay, you're in the airplane now, right? Mm. Where are you flying to? Straight to Cairo? Or what's the plan? I was in Ethiopia, so okay. short, short lay over there, and then on to Cairo from there. And, yeah, it was a long trip. I remember watching really cool movies on the plane. That's always an <laughs> exciting part, you know. And I watched uh, Game Day, I think it was, where they, or, or Draft, when they, when they pick the NFL drafts, and watching that movie. And it was cool for me, you know, to, I was watching a sports movie on the plane. And then obviously landing in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, and thinking to myself, hey, in a couple of months or a couple of weeks, I'm going to be back here on bicycle. So, and it was a shock for me. It was really an eye-opener to be in that airport and to see poverty. Wow, like, you know, I, I got out of the plane, got into the terminal, and there's just people everywhere. It's packed. I don't even know if half the people knew where they were going. But, I mean, there were bags, there were chickens, there were... It was it was madness. And um, I remember meeting a South African guy in the airport, and, and he was a he was a, uh, a missionary. And he was going... I remember him telling me his story. He was going to Egypt, and he didn't know why. <laughs> so, by faith, he had got into an airplane in South Africa... Flying to Egypt, got no place to stay, doesn't know what his mission is, but he knows that he feels that that's a place where he needs to be. And I remember just examining my heart and just thinking to myself, Keegan, you, you have a little bit of a plan. <laughs> like, you know where you're staying at least tonight. Don't worry about a couple of days. But he, he inspired me. And he might he never know that he inspired me. And I think that the more we can draw inspiration from people like that, people doing small things, the more we can add to our lives. You know, here I was complaining about, or not complaining, but being fearful about going to Egypt. And here's this guy. I mean, he had never even read about Egypt. And off he goes into he, the unknown. And he, he doesn't know why. And he doesn't know why. He's just, he's just going to see what happens. He's going to see what happens. What's the guy's name? Maybe he's watching this. If I remember correctly, the guy's name was Jeremiah. And, uh, yeah, sure. So I remember him, long, tall, lean guy. It's just a, such a bright, innocent face, you know, two years older than me. Amazing guy. So did you plan to meet him, meet up with him again, seeing as though you guys were both going to Cairo? I mean, uh, were you, were you, were you going to meet up or was it just like an encounter of inspiration and then cheers? I mean, I did. I, we exchanged the, uh, Details, so I, we added each other on Facebook. Um, I think, you know, he's, he's, he's deleted his account, account since, you know, since he's been in Egypt. But, I mean, yeah, we, we, met, we actually messaged a couple of times over Facebook when I, when I got there. So we did meet. We, we, we said we're going to meet, meet up there and have a final chat. And then in, again, in, it was like a... In Cairo. In Cairo, yes. And so it would be like a meeting a friend and then another final goodbye, you know. So it was... Just like meeting these amazing people and saying goodbye to them the next day. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so tell us about the flight then to to Cairo. I mean, so you you landed in Ethiopia. You boarded another plane. Yeah. the The first difficulty was the time difference. So on my plane ticket, it said a certain time. If I remember correctly, it was about half past ten at night. And I remember looking at my watch and being like, "Like this is in five minutes." You know, I'm, I'm going to miss this plane. And, um, you know, just being, everybody was confused with the times. They're like, my ticket says this. What's going on? What is the local time? My time says this. And, uh, yo, so that, that was quite stressful, you know, getting into the line and wondering actually what time this flight is going to take off. It was like there was no, not much organization happening in there. 
So I eventually got onto the plane to to Cairo. My bags had been checked the whole way through. So from Johannesburg International straight to Cairo. So I was on a on a plane wondering if my bike's okay, if all my bags are okay. Yeah, and then that was New Year's, you know, on the way to to Cairo in an aeroplane. And I remember it was quiet, everyone was watching movies, it was dark in the aeroplane, you know, that sound that that engine sound that you can hear, nobody's talking. And then it just went from 2014 to 2015.